The world and lore of the Jack and Daxter franchise has always been extremely captivating to me. It's a massive reason why it's my favourite game series, but I've never tried to articulate why that is or analyse the series to see what makes it tick for me, so that's what I want to do in today's video. This video won't be taking much of a look at things like characters or the actual storylines and plots of the games. This video is to mostly focus on the Jack and Daxter world as a whole. Let's start with the first game and what that brings to the table. It's the first story, so it needs to introduce us to its world and its rules. The game introduces us to the mystery of the Precursors and all the things they left behind. It establishes that they created the world, but vanished and left behind lots of ruins and artifacts. The mystery of the Precursors was compelling enough that it spanned the entire trilogy, and still has some unanswered mysterious elements to it, which is pretty impressive. Then we have Eco. This is a big one for me. I really love the concept of Eco and how it's used throughout the series because it's sort of like magic, but it all has specific rules and functions, so it's never used as a cop-out to explain something. For example, there's never a point in the games where you're left wondering, how did this happen? For the game to say, because Eco. I see that in a lot of fantasy stories where magic is the explanation for everything, and it just annoys me because it feels so lazy. Each eco colour has its own properties and uses, and it is, as Samus puts it, the life energy of the world. We also know, thanks to the design bible, that eco is what powered the precursor robots that we see littered throughout the world. And let's talk about those. What I really love about these games is that it does a lot of the world building and builds intrigue through gameplay and level design, instead of cutscenes more typically used. In the first level, Geyser Rock, if we pay attention there are a lot of precursor robots embedded in the rock. These have obviously been here for a really long time and haven't been active. It makes you wonder why and what would happen if they did awaken. And what's even cooler is we find out at the end of the game just how powerful these robots are through the final boss fight. It's not just the robots though, it's most of what's in the levels. I'm really tempted to spend the next 10 minutes just talking about all the cool precursor things in every level of the game, but we still have two other games to talk about so I'll keep it a little brief. Whether we look at Sentinel Beach or Snowy Mountain or even Lost Precursor City, there is always something in each level that reminds you that this isn't a reflection of our world, this is a wholly unique place. Yeah, in real life, places like Boggy Swamp and Forbidden Jungle exist, to an extent, but none of them have the remains of a powerful ancient race of beings who created the world. We see places like the temple in the Forbidden Jungle, or the massive structure in the Precursor Basin and just marvel at them, or places like the Lost Precursor City and are just gobsmacked by how advanced these mythical beings were. Lost Precursor City is one of my favourite levels because it's the one level in the game that is totally unique from the rest. Each of the other levels we have seen in a lot of other platformers before, but we haven't seen this kind of level before, at least not to the extent where it becomes an expected level prevalent in the genre. I think one of the biggest things about these games that is so great is the way it makes you feel. I'll be a bit more specific. This is especially evident in the first game more than the others, and I'm sorry if this doesn't make much sense, I'll try my best to explain what I mean. Once you start the game, watch the first few cutscenes and finish the tutorial, you're free to roam the world. What I love so much about this, and I don't know if this was intentional or it's just the way I feel when playing the game, is it makes you feel like you're a real part of the world, and it feels like you're kind of alone in it. Most of the game is gameplay, so what you're going to be doing most of the time is platforming on your own. Whenever I play this game seriously, meaning I'm playing it to enjoy the game instead of just zipping through it because I'm bored or need footage for something, I often get so immersed in the world and in Jack. Naughty Dog chose to make Jack a silent protagonist so you can connect with Jack more during the cutscenes and as Jason Rubin puts it, The idea is that you are Jack and you should feel that you are playing as Jack. That's why Jack doesn't say much. I don't know about you guys but I never connected with Jack on this level, but I do connect with him a lot through gameplay. Maybe this is just something that I have experienced, but I grew up playing these games and I loved them to bits. And Jack? alongside Toby's Spider-Man, was my hero. I was obsessed with the games when I was little and I always wanted to be Jack. And I think that's where this connection I have with Jack comes from. I feel like I have a personal connection with Jack because he's been there with me my whole life. And this comes back to connecting with him through gameplay. Because I feel this way, I feel like I'm completely immersed in the world. And it feels kind of lonely. Just imagine this. Imagine you're in Jack's shoes, or lack thereof, and you're given this grand quest and thrust into this magical world, and for a majority of it, you're completely alone. 
Of course, you always have Daxter with you, but it feels like you're alone with your best friend, but you're still alone. You're out in this dangerous world, just exploring. And that's what I love. There's no need for complex combat or explosive weaponry or anything like that. Most of the appeal of this first game for me is just being in this fantastical world and exploring it, just taking in the atmospheres, overcoming dangerous obstacles, and feeling completely immersed. This is something I feel is lost in the sequels. In the other games, you're always going to a person, talking to them, then doing a mission rinse and repeat. It loses that sense of exploration that the first game had, and I think it loses that immersion into the world the first one had as well. In Jack 1, I feel like it's just me, Jack, and the world, but I also feel like it's Jack and Daxter going on their adventure. It really feels like the two are really good friends, because you see them go to these fantastical locations and have this awesome adventure, even though they don't really talk to one another. In Jack 2 and 3, the games are more focused on story and narrative, which is fine, I love the games even more for their great stories, but I feel like Jack 1 as a whole is an adventure, whereas Jack 2 and 3 are stories. I also don't feel like Jack and Dax are as good of friends in these games. These games are more focused on story and character interaction, but it's noticeable how little character interaction there is between Jack and Daxter. There are some good examples, but I don't think there's nearly enough. Anyway, back to the immersion felt in Jack 1. Most of the appeal of this first game for me is just being in this fantastical world and exploring it, just taking in the atmospheres, overcoming dangerous obstacles, and feeling completely immersed. No level is a better example of this than Spider Cave. You ride along these minecarts and find this little path downwards into a cave. And before you know it, you're in this massive cave, crawling with spiders, with pools of dark eco, and absolutely dripping in atmosphere. And you're all alone, in this dark, dangerous cave. Next time you play this game, try playing through the whole thing with the music turned off. While I do love this music to bits, and it's kind of weird not having music during the boss fights and the high action parts, it really immerses you further into the world when there isn't any music. It's just you, Jack, and the world. It's an awesome experience and something really special, for me at least. Except maybe Spider Cave. The music itself sounds like it's just sound effects that you would hear while in the cave. So either way, the level has a great atmosphere. Uh, hey, so this is me while editing the video. So the last time I played the game without music was a long time ago. And when capturing footage for this, it really does change how you feel about different locations. Places like Misty Island and even when you first enter the temple in Forbidden Jungle are actually kinda chilling. Like, I took a moment to stop and listen to just how silent it was and how dark and atmospheric it was and goddamn, it really changed the mood of these levels. Also, now you're able to hear tiny sound effects you weren't able to hear normally and also Jack's breathing, it's really awesome. Just seriously, play the game like this with good headphones in a dark room, it's just incredible. Uh, anyway, back to the real stuff. I also really love when walking on Precursor Metal, the sound your footsteps make makes you feel so small in this massive world, and there's so much to explore and learn, I, I love it so much. Sorry this got kind of personal for a bit, but I just wanted to express how I feel about this game. Let's move on to Jack 2. So this game is a bit of a downgrade for me, because while I do love the direction the series took, I was a little disappointed there wasn't much precursor mystery like there was in the first game. Instead, we have Haven City and its surrounding areas. There is still some precursor elements to this game, but they more so tie into something new this game introduced, which I will go into now. Along with the precursors, one of the best things about these games that I love is the mystery of Ma. Ma was the founder of Haven City and was fabled to have fought off the metalheads and built the city and the shield wall to defend the people from them. They offer bits and pieces of information and we even find a statue of him so we can put a face to the name. But Naughty Dog goes out of their way to leave a lot of details out so we can try and piece together the rest of the story ourselves. We later find out from Kor that Ma built the city purely to protect the Precursor Stone from falling into the hands of the Metalheads. So now we know that Ma had access to the Precursor Stone, an artifact with immense power. So that begs the question, how did he get that? There are so many questions about Ma and I love it. I also love that in the Jack 2 strategy guide, as well as the design bible, 
It goes into more detail about Ma, telling of the legend of his arrival and how he disappeared and was seen to be talking to the precursors. So this has got to be one important and powerful guy, right? I love the mystery of Ma. It's one of my favorite things about this series. Now, what I was saying earlier about the precursors tying into Ma is still a little disappointing to me. The only places that we really see anything precursor are the Mountain Temple and Ma's Tomb. The temple, while one of the best levels in the game, is there housing the three artifacts which power the light tower in Ma's Canyon. And Ma's Tomb is Ma's Tomb. It's a great level and has the ancient oracle give us explanations about the Horaquan, or Metalheads, and it also houses the Precursor Stone. But again, this place is solely based around Ma, which is cool, but there's no locations or anything else in the story that invoke the mystery of the Precursors like the first game did. Don't get me wrong, I love Jack 2 and I love everything it brings to the table, but a little more Precursor mystery would have gone a long way. Jack 3, on the other hand, has the best of both worlds. It brings back the mystery of the Precursors, and it still continues with the mystery of Ma. Both of these mysteries are answered in this game as well. This game introduces us to a few new things as well, which flesh out Ma and the Precursors even further. First, we have the Golden Order of the Precursor Monks. These people are sworn to protect the secrets of the Precursors, and their temple is a really awesome level. Just exploring this place makes you think, what secrets are they keeping about the Precursors? Why do they have ancient oracles in the temple who are able to give us our light powers? It's such a cool level, and even though there isn't a heap of ancient precursor structures or artifacts, it still manages to evoke a lot of mystery. And then we have the Dark Makers, which I think is a really cool enemy. Although they are a bit too similar to the Metalheads in terms of what they do, the Dark Makers are a sworn enemy of the precursors and are perhaps the reason for their downfall. It's not much, but it adds to the backstory of the Precursors, so we know a little more about them. So I better address the two elephants in this script. Let's start with the Precursors. They're Otzels. A lot of people hate this revelation, but personally I kinda like it. It's certainly not what you would expect the Precursors to be, and yet they still leave this mysterious. There is one line, mostly played as a joke, that leaves more room for theorizing. Do not let our size fool you. We are the most powerful beings in the universe. We are? I already made a whole video about this, so you can check that out if you want. But needless to say, people like me will always take stuff like this and try to fill in the blanks and explain these things, and it's always a lot of fun. And in the final cutscene, we see them with a massive precursor ship, and it seems it has other precursors on board. Our hero! Which gets you thinking, what happened to all the precursors? Did they all get wiped out by the Dark Makers and Metalheads? Are the ones on the ship the only ones left? How many are left? Lots of questions, no real answers, and lots of mystery. Next, let's look at the other mystery, Ma. As I just said when I talked about Jack 2, I love the mystery of Ma, and I still love it in this game, as divisive as it is. So we know that Ma built Haven City, and he was this super awesome warrior, but we don't know too much else about him. In this game, it is revealed that Jack's birth name is Ma, so you would assume that he was named after the legendary figure, right? Well, you'd think that until you get to the final cutscene. Just ignore Ashlyn, her whole bit of dialogue makes no fucking sense. But what we do see is that Jack walks into the ship with the precursors and blasts off, then appears right behind Daxter. Many people have theorized that he didn't simply appear, but that he time traveled. Jack's name is Ma, so many people believe that he wasn't named after the legendary hero, but that Jack is the legendary hero. The theory is that when he went into the ship, the precursors took him back in time so that Jack could build Haven City, set up all the events of the previous game, and then appear behind Daxter like nothing happened. There is a lot of evidence to support this theory, and while I don't personally agree with it, it is a really cool idea. Recently, I just did a debate with NerdRage36 about this topic because he strongly believes that Jack is THE Ma. Links in the description if you want to check that out. No matter what side of the argument I stand, I love the mystery and the intrigue. I mean, hell, we're still debating this topic 16 years after the fact. What game or any story can make people do that? It's really impressive. And I'm sure that we'll be debating this forever. Or at least until there's an official answer given in a new game or reboot or whatever. Either way, we will still always have the original trilogy and the story it told us to use as our evidence for this argument for the rest of time. And that's pretty fucking awesome in my opinion. To try and sum things up, 
I love these games so much, in case you couldn't tell. But I love the universe it has created, the endless topics it has spawned, the interesting details, and the community of fans it has inspired. I love these games and I love talking about these games with or without other fans because the games are just so interesting and endlessly intriguing. Thanks for watching everyone.